You don't want to miss this episode. We're going to review R. Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. This is the book that started it all in the infinite banking world. We're going to do part one of a series. Let's dig into it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Control and Compound with Darren Mitchell. I'm your host. Joining me as always, Christina White. Christina, how are you today? I'm doing awesome, Darren. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm excited to review this book. I am too. It's kind of where it all started, right? But before we get started, I just want to remind everybody that if you're listening on your favorite podcast platform, make sure you subscribe and leave that five-star review. And if you're listening or watching on YouTube, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that bell button so you always know when new content is coming out. Don't forget to follow us on our socials at Control and Compound on TikTok and Instagram. And if you haven't already, head over to Infinite Banking for Real Estate Investors and Business Owners on Facebook and join our group. All right. Thank you, Christina. So yeah, this really is the book. So 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 Nelson Nash uh, from Birmingham, Alabama, uh, he was really, um, I think, the founder of Infinite Banking. Whole life's been around for, you know, 150 plus years, um, but he was the first one to kind of put it in print exactly how to use it sort of, um, and we're going to get into the book, but how to use it as, as a, like a bank, not, you're not actually being a bank, but like a bank. Um, but every book that's come since Nelson's book wouldn't exist without Nelson's book. And I include my book or my books on that. Uh, my books would never exist without Nelson. So if you are an infinite banker, we encourage you go read becoming your own banker, buy it on Amazon, reach out to us. We'll, we'll get you a copy. It's, it's an incredible book. Uh, now, it is, you know, a little outdated and, and, and American, and that was one of the, the, the reasons I, why I wrote the Be the Bank book, the Canadian kind of version, uh, and a little more um, recent, but it, it is literally the Bible in infinite banking. Yeah, so, the fundamentals, the, the fundamentals remain the same when you're reading it, right? So the strategy is the strategy, even though it's a, a little bit older, it still goes, yeah, yeah you still, you, you got to read that one, and it is something that they've done very well. Yeah, and just don't get hung up on some of the some of the illustrations or, or or numbers. I mean, Nelson even said if he had to do it again, um, he wouldn't have put the illustrations and some of the numbers in because people are like, oh, well, that those numbers don't apply to me are applicable to me. All the numbers are applicable to everyone. It's understanding the concept is 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 the key. And I guess the first sort of intro of the book, he talks about the concept of banking is the most important. Our most important business in the world. So if you want to, you want to be successful, you want to take control of your money, you need to understand banking. Yep, absolutely. So I think even how he starts the book, um, he has a, a quote in there when they talk about how if uh, the if 100% of the wealth was distributed today, in 10 years, 97% of it would be owned by 3% of the world, right? Now, I don't know if those numbers are exact. It could be 80-20, but still that that fact remains that it, the money flows and where it flows is extremely important. And that is those banks, right? It is a huge business. It's the biggest business in the world, the most important, right? Yeah. You think about that. If we, in, in Nelson's, Nelson's view, and I think he's accurate, if you evenly distributed all the money in the world, Within 10 years, 97% of it's back in the hands of 3%. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means some people understand how money works, how understand how money flows, and those people are going to gain control of it. And the majority of people don't understand how money works and how money flows, and they're not going to get a, get, a, get a handle on it. Because, you know, he talks about money and he, and he equates it to blood and water. Well, water and blood must flow or it dies. And there's really one pool of water, right? We think of all the lakes and the rivers and the ocean, but there's one pool of water and it's a constant cycle, right? The oceans evaporate, go up, rain vapors, wind goes back, recycles, rains again, freezes, thaws. It's one continuous cycle and money works the same way. So if money is going to go through the world, it's all going to come back into the people that know how to control it. Exactly. And this and and the cool part about this book is it teaches you how to control your money, which is such an important word for us, right? Um, getting that control. So instead of it just flowing back to the hands of those banks, you're going to learn how to be able to control it and, uh, you know, have that money flow back towards you instead of away from you, which is what we talk about all the time. Yep. And we learned that Nelson was uh, was a forester and he loved talking about uh, about forestry. He loved he loved being a pilot uh, and he was a real estate investor. And we're, we're going to dig into that a little more today. Uh, but what I love the the forestry forestry analogy is, you know, it's it's you got to think long term. 
You're not thinking what's going to happen next week, next month, next year. You're thinking what's going to happen in the next 20, 30, 40 years. And the, the analogy of always is best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago. And the second best time is today because we get that, you know, I was talking to a 50 year old the other day and he's like, Oh man, I wish I had heard of this 20 or 30 years ago. And it's like, yeah, well, great. But let's not be in 10 years going. I wish I had heard about it 10 years ago. So the best time 30 years ago, the second best time is today. So, you know, you're, you're not too old at 50. You're not too old at 55. There's still, there's still lots of time left. Um, but we can't go back in time. So let's make that decision today and, 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 and start taking control of the banking function. Yeah, no. And I, and I like that they give us the bank, the background of where Nelson had, you know, where his knowledge kind of stems from, um, that forestry side. So the forestry side where you talk about the combat, the compounding and, you know, the time that it takes to grow, grow this out, his life insurance side, where he's really learned about the life insurance, participating whole life, the dividends, and then his real estate side where he's learned, you know, where you learn about that leverage and the power of leverage and how he took those three different areas and that knowledge um, and really came up with the infinite banking concept, right? So it, yeah. it's cool that they they tell us where that came from because it's nice to see, you know, the thought process behind it. Yeah, and it, and it came from uh, from from an absolute crisis in his life, or multiple crisis 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 going on at the same time in in Nelson's life. Now, you know, again, uh, I'm not knocking Nelson Nash. It was a different time back then, but when when, when I you know first learned that he was buying half a million dollars of real estate with 90 day T bills. I was I was a little surprised, um, but and, and what happened unfortunately is the interest rates. I think he was paying about nine and a half percent, which was a pretty reasonable rate in the late seventies. And then within two or three years, all of a sudden it's twenty three percent. And if you think of that five hundred thousand at twenty three percent, what's that one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars a year? Well, that would be about triple today. Right? If we if we equate it to today's dollars. Um, so, you know, if you have a million and a half dollar loan and you're spending 300 and some thousand dollars a year, just in interest costs, I can see why that would be a a, a bit of a, a bit of a concern. And he just, he just was out of control. He wasn't in control of his money. And that was the big realization to Nelson is I'm not in control of my money. And I think for me, I go, you know, tell the story of 2008 when the stock market crashed. That's for me when I realized Wow, I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not in control of my money or my clients' money. Um, so sometimes it's those things you think are the end of the world that happen to you, and actually you look back and go, well, you know, thank God that happened to me because I wouldn't, I wouldn't have discovered what I discovered had I not gone through that 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 rough rough patch. Exactly. And that's what, you know, when, when it's described in the book, what was happening with Nelson, that's exactly where he was at. But, um, he had, he had uh, stuff in front of him. He had whole life policies and he had an imagination. He talks a lot about imagination and taking that, what he has had in front of him and turning it into something good, which is where the infinite banking concept came from. And, uh, they do spend a lot of time talking about imagination and how important it was in coming up with this, uh, concept or strategy, right? Yeah. And then he has some great analogies. So we're going to dig into that. Christina, uh, why don't you start us off in the grocery store analogy? Yeah. So the grocery store analogy and the reason that they use a grocery store in this analogy is because it is a, uh, a place where there is a buyer and you are a consumer and a seller. So it is a business where in it, you're going to be a consumer and a seller. Because when you own a grocery store, yes, you're going to be the business owner. You're going to make money off that store, but you also have to buy your groceries. So you're going to come back and you're going to buy your groceries through that store. So I really feel like the, the moral of this story is all about being an honest banker and not, um, you know, making sure that you keep that store and that entity running properly. Yeah. So being an honest grocer, he, he uses this, uh, the peas, the peas story, right? Yes. And, the, and, the, and the can of peas. And, the, and for those who haven't read the book, uh, the peas sell for 60 cents, but they cost 57 cents. So there's really only a 3% margin. And the whole premise is, well, if you're not an honest grocer, in other words, if your family member comes in and goes, well, I'm not going to pay for that can of peas. I'll just take it out the back door and, you know, eh, it'll be fine. Well, what Nelson explains is you're going to have to sell 15 additional cans of peas at, uh, or what, 15 or 20 cans of peas to make that three cents up to make back what you have to pay for that one can of peas that went out the back door. So you got a huge, huge hole to dig out of if you start taking everything out the back door. 
And I think that relates back to, Christina, your point of the infinite banking policies is to be an honest banker. When you take those loans in the early years, you need to pay those loans back. You can't, you can't borrow for a piece of real estate and never pay it back. You can't borrow from your infinite banking policy and never pay it back other than retirement. We're talking about the early years here. And I think really honest grocer, honest banker, trying to get that same same sort of consistency going. If you're going to be a grocer, you should be honest. If you're going to be a banker, you're going to be honest. If not, the whole thing fails. Exactly, because you're running it as a business, just as so a profitable business profitable business is going to, um, you know, they're going to pay for their own goods and that's what's going to make it profitable. When you want your infinite banking policy to work, you're going to repay your loans and you're going to work with the strategy and the concept, right? You've got to follow the rules for it to work. And that's how, you know, I think I feel like that's how this story relates um, to infinite banking so well. Don't steal the peas. Don't steal the peas. There's the moral of the story. Don't steal the peas. Repay your loans. Okay. All right, now let's dig into the next part of the book. He gets into the problem. Um, And and Christina, how would we identify the problem um, that Nelson refers to in the book? So the problem is really traditional finances. <laughs> like it's it's literally the average Canadian is the problem and how um, their finances are working right now to this day. And this has not changed. I know that uh, they look at numbers and they say, this numbers can't be the same from when he wrote the book, but absolutely, I believe that they actually are pretty near close to the same. Um, but he talks about how, you know, your paycheck comes into your bank account. Well, first you've got the taxes that are going to be paid. Um, but afterwards, your, uh, your, your paycheck's going to get distributed, right? So it's going to go to things like your mortgage, your car payments, um, you know, insurances and home insurances, and then it's going to be on lifestyle and spending. Um, and when we start looking at all those things, we can you dig into this and you actually do the math on it, you're going to find the problem. Um, and the problem that Nelson discovered is that 34 or 34.5% of where this uh, of this money is actually going to paying interest like it is actually paying interest so 34 so you you're trying to save they, and and he actually says that the average home is saving 10% which i think is you know yeah. I don't know if that's actually that's, happening out there. I think that's wishful thinking, especially uh, in, in the current marketplace. Yeah, yeah, and with interest rates the way that they are, I think that 34 could be even higher if we did the math on it. But that's a huge problem. That is a big problem that I don't think people have done the math on or even you know took took into account when they're financing their vehicles, they're financing their houses, their boats, their, you know, all of those things that are financed, there is a price that comes with that. And that's what Nelson's trying to shed a light on in this in this chapter the problem. Yeah. I mean, if you think of it, let's just throw some numbers to it to try to, you know, say someone's making a hundred thousand dollars a year or family income doesn't matter. Well, if 34,500 are going to financing charges, financing for all the different things we finance in life, 34 and a half, 34,500 going to that. And let's say realistically, they're saving 5%. So they're saving 5,000. What does everyone focus on in traditional financial planning? Well, on that $5,000 of savings, did I get 6%, 7%, or 8%? Well, that's, it's not irrelevant, but it's almost irrelevant compared to what about the $34,500 you are putting into financing? What if, what if we could structure that differently so maybe that was only 32 or 30 or 31? Well, now we start talking about doubling, tripling your savings rate, right? Instead of saving 5%, Maybe it's 10 or 15. That is way more significant than whether let's focus just on the rate of return for the small amount we're saving. Yeah, which we talk about all the time, right? And in your book as well with the wealth assurers, it's there's so much focus and energy on getting this rate of return and people are missing out on the things that are really eroding their savings and their wealth. The things like, you know, your your taxes, the volatility in the markets, the fees, the spending and the finance, like all of these things. If we look at those in a big picture and we focus on some of those things that we actually have control of, like let's go back to the control. Do you have any control over that rate? of return that you're attempting to get in the stock market? No, right? Do we have control over some of these things? Can we, um, you know, re, like re, uh, rejig our finances and, you know, get our financing down, get our taxes down? Are there things we can do for that? 
Absolutely. We know that. So the problem is, is that so many are wired to focus on the wrong thing. And that's that traditional way of thinking when it comes to our finances and our savings is rate of return, rate of return, rate of return, which is not the actual problem. And it's not something we have, we have control over. Yeah. And I think one of the other really key parts of the book that, uh, that I loved in this first part is Nelson talks about you finance everything you buy, yep. right? So you either pay interest or you give up interest. And we talk about this debtor saver, wealth creator, similar all the, all the time, but people only tend to focus on one of those. They only focus on what is the interest I pay, but they don't look at the second part is if I pay cash, what is the interest or growth I lose? And especially, you know, that 34.5% going towards financing charges, you know, the, the million dollar question is if you, it, it, if you were knowingly and unwillingly wasting money there that you didn't have to, when would you want to know about it? Now, yesterday, <laughs> but now. <laughs> exactly. So, so if you can restructure your finances to take control of the banking function in your life and that 34 and a half can, can, can drop significantly and you can be in more control, that's huge. But back to the, to the, you finance everything you buy. What people don't look at is, okay, so I spend a hundred dollars of cash so I don't have to spend my other money. Well, it's not just that hundred dollars you lose. It's what that hundred dollars could have grown to. You picture what that hundred dollars or thousand dollars or hundred thousand dollars could have grown to over the next 30, 40, 50 years. How many properties could you have bought? How many business could, could you have put that in? Could you put that into a property that's, you know, going to get you hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars more. So people, again, you got to remember you finance everything you buy, you pay interest or you give up interest. Yep. Opportunity cost, right? That's what you're losing there. The fact that you could, you know, that you can make money on it, um, which is super important. And then, uh, and then he gets into the, the airplane analogy. So, uh, so Nelson was, uh, was an aviator. He's a pilot. Uh, I love the, the, the airplane story and, um, you know, my brother's a pilot and uh, I'm sure there's more to it. You know, we like to make fun of him. It's push, push for takeoff to Toronto or land in Toronto, take off for Calgary, but I'm sure there's more to it. But what I loved about the airplane analogy is he talks about airplanes don't fly in a vacuum. So he used the analogy from to fly from Birmingham to Chicago. And he goes, okay, so you get an airplane that can do hundred miles an hour. So you get up there, but all of a sudden there's a 345 mile an hour headwind right in right in the front of the front of the plane well what's really happening here is 345 mile an hour headwind plane can only go 100 you're really going negative 245 you want to go from birmingham to chicago but you're on your way to cuba okay and there's you know there's a reason why it's 345 miles an hour which is 34.5 percent that's what most people are faced with so nelson's first thing is well if you've got a headwind like that you shouldn't be up in the air flying anyway. You should land immediately. You should land immediately because you're just going backwards, okay? And people go, okay, well, you wait till there's no wind, and now I can fly at 100 miles an hour from Birmingham to Chicago, and that's better. Yeah, okay, that's definitely better than the headwind. But if you can control your environment, and all of a sudden you can take control of your banking, the banking function in your life, and now you create that tailwind, well, if you have a 345-mile tailwind and your plane can go 100, 100 miles an hour, now you're going 445 miles an hour versus everyone else going minus, minus 235. So you've got a 690-mile difference on how, far, how fast you're advancing versus everyone else. And, and to me, that really kind of sums up the infinite banking is if, if you want to create a tailwind in your financial life, you need to take control of the uh, 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 take control of your money through we think an infinite banking policy. We didn't get into the product yet, but the concept is take control of your money, create that tailwind instead of battling the headwinds like every other Canadian is out there. Exactly. No, and I love that analogy, right? Because it makes perfect sense. You need to create the environment for success, and that kind of reigns in all other factors of our life at life as well. Why wouldn't it be in our finances? Why wouldn't we want to, you know, take control, create our banks? All right. So then Nelson gets into Christina. Um, why don't you create a bank? And he actually walks through the steps on what you'd need to create a bank. And again, the U U U.S. version here, but. Uh, he goes through what you would need to create a bank. You'd need to study the business. You need to raise at the time. He thought 20 million 
uh, dollars more or, or capital, apply for a bank charter, get approved? What are the other things you have to do to get a bank in Nelson's book? Yeah, so you got to apply for the bank and then you got to purchase the building. You got to do your marketing. Like people aren't just going to show up at your door because you decided to open a bank. So there's a lot of work that's going to go into setting up a bricks and mortar bank out there, right? There's a lot of work and money that you and have to be raised. You got to get money. You got to get depositors, yeah. right? You've got to convince people, I don't know, advertising or offer, offer an incentive or interest rate. You've got to in, entice people to actually put deposits into your bank because if you're a bank and you lend money you can't lend money until you have money so you need to convince people to to loan money in there and then you need to loan money out now he talks about the fractional reserve banking which is big in the states you know big in canada i mean as well north america bank takes a dollar and loans it out nine or ten times and we 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 have an episode we talk about that um but yeah, so a bank, you know, bank takes a thousand dollar deposit. They don't just leave it there sitting there for the next time you're back. They take that thousand dollars and they loan it out multiple times. Fractional reserve banking. So incredible profitable uh, industry banking. Yeah. If you if you look across the world, I mean, look, you go into all your b- bank branches. I mean, here in Halifax, we can go down and you know there there's a there's a one of the banks. It's like a hundred year old building. There's like twenty two foot ceilings in here marble floor i mean you get some high high high-end buildings where these banks are why because they're so profitable in in canada we've got the big five banks that every year the profits just seem to keep increasing increasing so it's an incredibly profitable thing but are you going to go through all that to start a bank christina can't see myself doing that. No, it seems like <laughs> seems like a lot of work. I don't know. Uh, and and the chances of getting that uh, charter are going to be you know slim to none yeah, as well, yeah. right? I, so it's not easy uh, for the uh, average uh, person. Control and Compound's not actually looking to go start our own bank here tomorrow. And, and some people are like, oh, you can't be your own bank. Again, we're not telling people. And I wrote the book, Be the Bank. I don't mean you to go actually start a bank. What we're trying to do is we need you to act like a bank. We banks take control of the money, they have velocity of money, they loan the money out, they take loans, they pay them back, they multiply their money, they compound it, tax, they compound it a lot of it tax-free for the rest of their life. All those things, we want you to act like a bank, we don't physically want you to be like a bank. Exactly. And act like the right, like follow the rules of the right bank too, because he does go into this chapter on, um, we know that some of the banks fail, so they're not the good banks. We don't want you to be one of those banks. Um, but he talks about, uh, one in there in Texas, the first national yeah. bank. Um, and when it was going out of business, going bankrupt, and it had a lot to do with that fractional reserve, uh, banking, right. Um, because of the fact that they didn't have everything backed, which is unlike the banks that we create. Um, but what happened with it, right. When they went and they looked down and and dug into it was that a lot of these loans that weren't being repaid that they had lent out they were actually owned by the shareholders and they had been putting them into oil they weren't making that money it wasn't coming back so they decided they weren't going to repay it and that kind of rings true to a story we just talked about with the grocery store right it sounds like they didn't want to you know it sounds like they stole the piece right instead of repaying those loans to their bank they decided well I'm the bank owner why would I need to do that I'm just going to write it off and the bank failed, right? And it failed miserably in that, uh, in that example that he gave in the book. So, yeah. um, yeah, it was interesting to see. He does very, he really relates things to real life stories and things that happen so that you can get a good picture, um, what it looks of what it all looks like. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the old, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So being a bank, you know, like first national, the, the, the Texas example, well, they, they they didn't do it properly. They were they were taking make, making a bunch of loans to themselves that they never should have. Well, an infinite banking policy is going to work the exact same, right? We're going to give you control of your money, and you're going to be able to access money. We hope for opportunities and emergencies, but you can access the money for whatever you want. So if you're not a good banker, if you're not an honest banker, and you're taking out these loans to go on vacation and do all kinds of just you know cover expenses and, and go on trips or something and not pay and them not back. paying them back. Well, that's a real challenge. You're going to be the same as first national. It's it, you, you had a good idea, but unless you pay off those, pay back those loans, treat, treat the loans. Like when you go to take a loan for yourself, is it, does this make sense? It's not just, can I access money? Same as the line of credit, right? People get worked up or people get uh, undisciplined with their line of credit and they treat it like a checking account. Well, if you treat your infinite banking policy like a checking account, 
I don't like the long-term success of that, that model. Yep. And you don't understand the power of leverage either, right? Like you have to understand it to use it. And that does go back to, I do like the, the first rule where you have to do, you know, to open a bank, the first thing you need to do is really understand it and do your research, which I do think rings true on both sides. So when you're doing your be your own bank, becoming your own banker, doing your research, you know, understanding it, like it really is just a product unless you learn how to utilize it. And that's what Nelson's teaching in this book. It's how to utilize this, this product product that's out there um, for more than just life insurance. I love it. Christina, great wrap up. Let's uh, let's leave it there. We're going to start the next episode on how you create your own bank. And we're going to go through step by step how you create your own bank or your own infinite banking um, policy. And uh, we're going to break that down for you next time. So don't miss it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to this podcast. If you're listening on YouTube, please like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. If you're listening on your favorite podcast platform, please leave us a five-star review and subscribe. And if you want more information, check out our website, controlandcompound.com, and you can sign up for an education session with one of our wealth coaches.